Uh, okay, so <clears throat> now I want to present you uh, something very interesting. I actually, before the presentation today, I kind of forgot about this. I haven't used them in a while, but they actually can be pretty good. So I'll start using them from tomorrow. <laughs> uh, first, I have a question for the RSI. Uh, is it more suitable to use the RSI for Forex or for commodities and stocks, etc.? Where does it give a better signal if something is overbought or oversold? I would say it depends from the graph, but uh, for me it's going to be more usual if it use it in a range. And whenever you see that it's a break in the range, the RSI will give you a signal that uh, it's overbought or oversold. And here, actually, you can combine it with the volume. So if we see a spike into the volume, so it's uh, getting higher and higher, this can give us an idea that probably uh, either that the RSI is giving you a signal that something is overbought, so this might be uh, break of the range, so the uptrend, let's say, may continue. Or if we see that uh, the RSI is giving you a sign out that uh, it's again overbought, but the volume is again low, the volume is low, uh, that means that probably it will retrace back and it will, the price will fall. So I would say that probably into the stocks and commodity business, uh, into commodity uh, area, for me, it's more suitable. Yeah, I agree. I mean, RSI has been invented for stock market, and uh, it makes more sense if you something important that we didn't uh, really do uh, here. You have to to analyze how indicators are made. So you have to look at the codes of each indicator, and you have to learn them, and you have to study them so you can understand in which case they are useful or not useful. And if you study the code of the RSI, you will see that it's super useful for stock market, uh, rather than for forex uh, market. Okay, so since I'm not allowed to ask any more questions, as we are, you know, uh, the time has passed very quickly, and we don't want to lose you here with all those lines, uh, let's just continue with the divergences uh, real quick, and then if you have any questions, you can ask each of us uh, regarding anything that interests you. So what are divergences? Basically, it's a difference beti between the chart you're seeing and the indicator. Uh, usually, usually for divergences, uh, you can use uh, MACD indicator. Uh, Pascal will tell you just a few words in a bit about it. Uh, or you can use the RSI. In this case, I'll give you an example with the RSI. The whole idea is that uh, divergences can uh, basically tell you if a continuation of a trend is coming or if a reversal of a trend is coming. And we have two types of divergences. One of them is the regular divergences and the other is hidden divergences. Actually, it took me quite some time today to spot some hidden divergences for, to take examples for this chart. They're pretty hard to be found, but the regular ones are more often. So uh, here on, the, on your right, uh, we have a divergence. You can see that the price is making lower lows. We talked about that uh, on our last presentation. And th at the same time, the indicator line, so imagine this is the RSI, is making higher lows. This is a regular bullish divergence. Okay. So regular bullish divergence can be found like that. Price is making lower lows. Indicator is making higher lows. This, uh, usually the regular uh, divergences tend to predict, if I may say, uh, a re potential reversal, while the hidden divergences usually uh, can predict a potential uh, continuation of the trend. So we have a bullish uh, regular divergence and a bearish one. At the bearish one, we have the price making higher highs, so basically we are in an uptrend, but at the same time, the indicator is showing a decrease. It's making lower highs. So uh, usually when you spot that, you can expect for this uptrend to finish and a new downtrend to begin. And here are some examples. Uh, actually, unfortunately, because of the uh, this thing, it's not very clear seen, but here 
you have a downtrend, you have uh, lower lows being formed, and and now they, yeah, can we move it a bit up or? Okay, so you mark this period where you found the divergence. So the idea here is that we have lower lows on the chart itself. Now we see only the chart, I think. And you have, which is unseen here, unfortunately, higher highs in the same period. Yeah, I can, I can just, yeah, I can show, for example, here between, in this period, you have higher lows uh, of the RSI, and here you also have higher lows, so this, this is not a divergence. The divergence is when we have, uh, this is actually a bullish divergence in this, uh, this example, yeah? Uh, we have lower lows, and the indicator is going like here, but as I said, you cannot see it, unfortunately, here. Maybe, uh, maybe return to the previous one. Yeah, okay. Next, a bearish regular divergence. Now this one you can see. You can see that the price has been in a very long uptrend. Uh, this is actually, again, the H4 uh, graph, so it's pretty, pretty old uptrend. Sometimes divergences can be spotted uh, when the trend has been uh, pretty old and it is about time to reverse as the markets work in cycles and at one point the trend will reverse. So the bearish divergence as we gave in the uh, graph on the first slide about divergences, uh, the price is making higher highs and if you mark the, that period, the RSI or MACD depends what indicator you're using, but it's easier for me to spot it on the RSI the in indicator line is making lower highs. So this is a divergence that uh, tells you that maybe we'll have a reversal soon, and as you can see, we actually had one. Now, hidden divergence. Uh, those are a bit harder to spot. Usually, after them, uh, we can expect the continuation of the trend, although sometimes the trend reverses. Again, two types, bullish hidden divergence and bearish one. Here, the price is making uh, for a bullish hidden divergence to be, uh, to exist. The price uh, on the chart has to make higher lows while the indicator line is making lower lows. If you find a period where there is a difference between the price chart and the indicator line, you can expect for this uh, trend, in this case an uptrend, to continue since this is a bullish divergence. Now the bearish divergence, uh, we have a downtrend. We are having a price obviously that's making lower highs as it does in a downtrend. But at the same time, the indicator is making higher highs. In those cases, again, you can expect for this downtrend to continue. I'm gonna show you uh, two examples. So here we have a bullish divergence. We are having an uptrend. Uh, right here, you can see the uh, spot where uh, we have higher lows. But at the same time, although uh, there is not a huge difference, sometimes it's hard to spot divergences because uh, the difference between the two dots, for example, which we, you want to connect, is very, very small. They can also be at the same level. Uh, so you shouldn't count that as a divergence. Uh, as, and as you can see here, the, although the two points are very close, uh, as a, almost on a one level, still we have some decline. So this is a bullish hidden divergence. And as, as you can see, when it ends, the price continues up. Now, the bearish hidden divergence, as we said, we are having a downtrend, we are having lower highs, while, again, as you can see, uh, almost 
on one level. The indicator line is for the same period is making higher highs or higher points. So we expect for the downtrend, which started somewhere here and we are here to continue. And this is what happens. Sometimes the reaction is that strong, but sometimes it's a bit more uh, like here. Now, Pascal will tell you a few words about the MACD, and basically, you can also use it to spot divergences. And I just want to say uh, here that if you, uh, you can either go uh, in the in on the internet and just write uh, divergences cheat sheet or something like that, you can find those things in one document, so you can use them to uh, practice spotting divergences or you, even after you start trading them because sometimes as I said I haven't used them in a while because I just forgot about them not because they're not good or if you want you can send us an email to our official email uh, or mine email or values email and we can send you this cheat sheet I was gonna give you the <coughs> mic so MACD, it's uh, another very uh, common indicator. It's very easy to understand how it works. You have two moving average, the blue and the red. You make the difference between the two moving average, so blue minus red, and you have the MACD, as simple as that. So the MACD, it's this line, the blue one. So right now, forget about this one and forget about uh, this. Uh, so why div divergence happen? It's and why it works. And uh, divergence is one of the most powerful tools that we can have by reading charts. So why it works? Uh, let's try to zoom. So here I will zoom V square. I don't know if it was clear with the animation. Okay, so oops. As you can see here, I, I told you huh, that the MACT, so MACD, it's the difference between the blue and the red. Okay? So what happened here? We have the movement which is going down. So we have a downtrend. You can see the Bollinger Band, by the way, huh, here. It goes down. So we try to combine everything. And what we can see is that the distance between the two moving average, it's smaller here than here. So this is why you have the MACD, which is at this level, at this point, because the difference between the two moving average are, let's say, important. And here, the MACD is higher. So you have a divergence because here the price has been down, while here the MACD has been up. So it's, it was important to understand that it's because there is, uh, the market is slowing down that you have divergence. And why divergence are useful is because it's hard to see without indicators that the market has slowed down. So it can be pretty useful. Um, here, what I'm, so I don't know, because it's very light, so I will tell you what is happening here. There is Bollinger Band everywhere. It's very light, so I don't know if you see them. Here in red, it's a Bollinger Band going down. So I will explain you how me, I, I, I like to use uh, divergence. Here you have another Bollinger Band going down. So I know you don't see, but here you have a phase one in the middle. So you have phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, and again, uh, uh, phase four, remember, you take the lowest, the highest, you draw two lines, and again, you see it's, it's working almost every time. I mean, it's always amazed me, uh, this trick. So then, what you do, you use your MACD, and you, you, you look at the trend uh, with the Bollinger Band on the MACD. It was this uh, draw, I mean, this, uh, uh, um, this uh, downtrend, and here. And then, you can see that the market has been down, you can also see that I like to, uh, as I said, uh, put, I mean, uh, make a top and a low every time I have a change in my Bollinger Band. And here, and here as well. And what we can see then, oh, okay, I didn't do it, it's divergence. So here, the market is going down, so the low 
I mean, the, low, the lowest, the low are going lower. And here, the difference between the two trends is different. The MACD has been higher. Here also, you have a first uh, downtrend, a second downtrend, and here you have the MACD, which is going higher. So this, I think, for me, it's the easiest way to spot divergence. You use, uh, uh, you use Bollinger Band, you use MACD, and then you just try to spot with the MACD and the Bollinger Band the correspondence, and then you try to find divergence. So what does it mean? When you are here, since you have a divergence, you know that the movement, the global movement, has lost strength. So maybe it will be hard after for the market to keep going down, and maybe after you, you might have an interesting downtrend. And that's all. Maybe you want to say something. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that, as you can see, divergences work. Uh, but don't just head home and jump on the market trying to trade divergences. Try to practice your eye for finding divergences because a lot of traders make the mistake that uh, they understand it. Actually, it's simple, yeah. Price making lower lows here, higher highs on the indicator, so it's a divergence. But sometimes when you get too much into that, you start to imagine divergences and start seeing divergences when there is none. Uh, and sometimes it's really hard to spot them and you just imagine there is a divergence, so you make a mistake. So train your eye before uh, starting to use divergences. And then a uh, last trick. Uh, I don't know if we see good here. I will remove this. So I told you that MACD is done with uh, the distance between the moving average, but also there is one thing here and two lines, actually. This is the uh, MACD of the MACD. It's, it's, it's again a fractal. Huh? So remember, MACD is the difference between the two moving average. The MACD of the MACD is the difference between the MACD and its own moving average, because you can put moving average also on indicators. So uh, I don't know if we can see clearly here, but here we have the Bollinger Band. So we have a phase one. We have phase two, phase three, phase four. The phase four, I, you, don't, you can't see, but it's here. But we're going to send you the presentation for the ones who are interested. And remember what we said. The phase four shows the end of a trend. Do you think that we could have find a way to, let's say, anticipate the phase four? Yes. We have a divergence on the MACD of the MACD. So the name is OSMA. So on the OSMA, we have a divergence. Take a look. Here we have a downtrend, so it's going down. Uh, we go there. It's go down, and here it goes up. So we can anticipate the phase four before they happen. So we can analyze the strength inside the bubble of a Bollinger Band, and it works almost every time. Uh, here you have the same. You have a divergence. You know, like here the, in the bubble, it's going low, it's going down, and here you have a divergence. Uh, it works exactly the same when you have an uptrend. So again, look, you have a Bollinger Band going up. The phase four is here. And as you can see, you have a divergence before, because here it goes down, where here it was going up. So again, you have a lot of way to, uh, to analyze it and to combine all the different concepts that you have seen tonight. Uh, and divergence is one of my favorites, because it works pretty good. Yeah, so about the Fibonacci numbers, I'm going to tell you more about. Uh, this is not my first slide, though, but uh, yeah, OK. So some of my slides are obviously gone, but never mind. I'm going to do it like this. So just a quick uh, introduction about Fibonacci. He's an Italian mathematician, something that you may don't know about him, is that uh, he brought the Arabic numbers into Europe. I don't know if the, f the correct, sh the correct uh, saying is Arabic numbers, but the uh, numbers that we're using now are coming from him. And uh, also, he's actually not the founder of the Fibonacci numbers. He just used them into a book. And uh, because it's his book, now they're going on his name. But this is only if you're interested. So basically, what are they representing? Uh, so how they're, they're formed by uh, starting with 0 and 1. And every new number is uh, the combination of the previous two. So when you have 0 and 1, the next one is uh, 1. So we have, when we have 1 and 1, the next one is 2. And this is how they're working. 
So in the trading, the most important levels that we need to look for is uh, the numbers 23, uh, 38, 50, and 61. So those are the numbers when we draw the Fibonacci uh, lines that are going to give us uh, an idea that there we can expect some uh, additional reaction from the price. Uh, I had an example with this, but uh, obviously it's gone, so uh, never mind. Here, we can't see it actually, but I'm going to show it to you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually here. But uh, so this is zero and this is 100. So this is how it starts. So this is 23, this is 38, this is 50, and this is 61. So basically, those are the numbers that you can look for additional idea where we can uh, expect uh, price actions and price reaction, except from the traditional uh, support and resistance. Sometimes they match with the traditional support and resistance, sometimes they don't. So basically how you draw it, uh, there was a high here, but you can't see it obviously. So you just uh, click here, you move to the bottom of the movement and uh, the platform or whatever you're using, it will draw you the next line automatically and you just uh, have to keep uh, watching them and uh, look for a reaction. So here you can see, we can see that uh, we already mentioned that uh, the support and resistance lines are not exactly lined, they're zones. So here you can see in this zone, we can have a reaction. Here it's very well shown that the is print like a support area. As you can see, there is a movement. Here it's traded into the range between 50 and 61. And after this break, we can see a reaction on every line. And also here we can see a bounce. And now the price is testing the 33 area and uh, sorry the 23 area and uh, we might observe another downtrend um, yeah this was uh, basically the basis of the Fibonacci line if you have some other questions I can uh, show it to you because uh, as I mentioned some of my slides are gone so if you have questions go back further nope yeah <laughs> So yeah, if Pascal wants to add something here. Yeah, so it's actually you about the final words. Uh, I just want to say that the Fibonacci numbers again work because traders are making them work, not because those are some magic numbers. No, they can be magic, but yeah. <laughs> final words from you, Pascal? No, me. Don't use it. So okay then, if you uh, have. Uh, I, I, I know it, and for me it works, but uh, yeah, I don't like it. Yeah. So the main, the main thing, and the most important thing is that uh, when you draw them, and if there is a none of a support line that uh, you can uh, draw it by yourself or you, you can see it, you can expect from the price to react somewhere on the, those lines. So this is the most important thing that you have to remember here. And uh, this was uh, everything from us. And you have some other questions, please ask. We'll be here for you to answer them we don't have time but I wanted to add something about Fibonacci <laughs> I know I just wanted to say that uh, I'm not sure if you told them how you draw the whole thing yeah this is for a downtrend but for an uptrend you take the lowest from here and drag it from the left to the right basically okay. yeah. We just look for a big movement, and if we see there are number of downtrends, we take it from the top to the bottom, or to the bottom to the top. No, it doesn't need to be book, big movement. You can use it or, or, or for scalping as well. Scalping is when you take multiple trades into a very short period of time on a lower time frame. Uh, it works there as well. So basically, whenever you see a movement and you want to define some lines where we can uh, find support and resistance when they actually don't exist, you can draw Fibonacci and uh, the price, it's very possible to react there and you can take your decisions on them. Yeah, what you can add, uh, it's uh, if I... Uh, because yeah, it was maybe not... But those levels has been designed by uh, taking one point here and this point there. And it shows the level that in the future might work, okay? So don't pay attention to what is on the left. And the percentage, so the 20, 38, blah, blah. Yeah, it's 23. and It's actually 23.80 and something, but sometimes they're different. After the dot, 
it depending from the platform how it's calculating them, so that's why I'm telling only the first number. But they are percentage, so it's 23% of the movement, 38% of the movement, 61% of the movement. And for the one who wonders how we find those numbers, uh, as Valo has said, you make a zero plus one, one, one plus one, two, two plus one, three, three plus two, five, five plus three, eight, eight plus uh, five, uh, 13, and you have it there. 21, 31 plus 21, 34, 34, remember Raggy Horner, uh, 24 plus 21, 55, and so on. And then if you divide 55 by 34, or 44 by 21, or 21 by 13, and you, you do it until the infinite, you always find this number. One, 61, uh, that's all. Always, always. So you can, you can have fun uh, at home, and actually it, it, it works with any number. So if you take a spreadsheet tonight and you start with uh, 258, and you add uh, the number you want, so let's say 35, and uh, you make 35 plus 248, you end up with a result. And then you make the, this result plus uh, the result before and so on, and when you divide, you always find uh, 166. One. So this is a magical thing about Fibonacci uh, numbers. And this is why they said, okay, we're gonna look at 61% of uh, the movement. Then if you make 100 minus 61, you find uh, 38.2. And this is how those numbers are found, basically. And so it means that, yes, in the future, maybe, markets will react to this level, to this level, to this level. That's all. Okay, do you have questions to what we have seen tonight? No? Yeah? How much is, uh, how much are those indicators really weird? Or how much do they come from software that was programmed by people like you who want to use these indicators and then software trades other with these indicators and then it makes like self being problems? Nobody. Mm. <laughs> So if I understand the question is? All indicators are done by, compu by computer. So each, every indicator is done by, by the computer, by the software. But humans can. The, the decision? I think, I think I got the question, but uh, what I can uh, give you as an answer that it will mainly work on the real stock exchange. For example, if you're trading uh, stocks and commodities with uh, real exchange of uh, contracts, because there the softwares are programmed to react on uh, those uh, uh, signals. And uh, even though the people sometimes may ignore them, they will always react on them and they will give uh, reaction on the actual chart and the actual uh, price. But uh, in the Forex, as uh, Pascal said, it's um, a de decentralized market, right? Uh, they'll not have the same impact. So in those markets, they're probably mostly affected by the people that are trading on those markets. Is this? Yeah, because for example, in the stocks, uh, where you have uh, multiple orders that are put on one and the same price and they can appear and uh, appear in a matter of uh, milliseconds. So basically the software is doing this. When, so whenever the, the indicator is given the sign of the software, it will appear the order, but whenever the, software, the indicator gives a, another sign, it will disappear. So this will react the, uh, react the size because there will be, as I mentioned you, the spread, the difference between the, the sellers and the buyers, it will increase or decrease. So this will give a reaction on the price. This answer the question? Yes, maybe more complex. Yes, the answer is the question. No, I, I, stay, I, I still didn't understand the question. I just hear from the people like you traders, they write their own programs who react on certain lines by When you mean you rewrite our own program, like uh, our own indicators? Uh, forex robots. Ah, I think forex, forex robots. Ah. And so the question is? So if, if we write algorithm? Yeah, I hear from my software that he wrote his own programs. So he's just watching his program first. It works like 20 minutes a day, the program makes enormous amounts of money, and he's doing nothing. He's just so smart to understand. The math is like you, for example, and then he watches how the program makes the right five and seven decisions. 
I just wanted to say here, do you know how many of the softwares, never mind if they're done by one person or like uh, the big banks, Mayo Ranch or like Morgan Stanley, do you know how much of them are efficient for a hundred year uh, time period? Uh, do you know how much of the softwares are efficient for a hundred time, uh, for a hundred year time period? So how, of, uh, how much of them are working uh, actually? So it will be around none or maybe one. So that's why even if the traders, uh, if the big investors are, tra are trading with softwares, in the long run, they are causing them losses. But uh, they usually, uh, they're mostly using them to manipulate the price and to support or to uh, make a, uh, fake resistance uh, in a matter of milliseconds in order to scare the traders, the small traders, so they can uh, do basically manipulations which are not, yeah, but yeah, only this I'm going to say. But yeah, if I understood the question is if we use algorithmic trading or manual trading, right? Yeah, if this exists, yeah. And, uh, but the problem with those programs is uh, what Valo said. Uh, very few of them works. And when they work, they work for a, a, a short time period. But it exists. I mean, I, I know few people who trade 100% uh, automatic. They make a lot of money. Your friend might be one of them. Uh, but as Valo has said, uh, uh, it's very complicated to automate a strategy. The, the best uh, algorithm that works it's when you make something that can't be done by a human. If someone tries to automate a manual strategy, he has very few chance that it works because humans uh, take decisions according to a lot of things. But if, you're, if you try to use a, a, a strategy which can't be used by human and it's fully uh, automated, um, it can work, but it's super hard. And also automated systems cannot take into account uh, certain events uh, that actually move the market, like, uh, for example, um, devastating earthquakes somewhere or uh, stuff like that, which we can take into account because we can read about them, but the software, I mean, probably it can be done in theory, but I haven't heard of a software that is done to take out the news uh, from like all the internet and analyze them and also based on them make uh, smart decisions. This will be maybe, uh, in the near future, uh, but it will, they will <laughs> probably overtake us if that happens. Yeah. Actually, some robot for news exists, but... Uh, some what? For news. Ah. Uh, it's called sentiment, so they, they go on over internet and they try to analyze sentiment. And the most famous one is uh, Twitter. Uh, it's a bot who is analyzing a uh, tweet because as you maybe know, Twitter is the most uh, important uh, source of information in the world for finance. So every trader has Twitter uh, connected. And one robot uh, was analyzing the tweet of Trump. And according to what Trump was saying, he was buying or selling and they won a lot of money uh, just like that. Uh, you had another question? No, okay. Okay, so if there is no more question. So next week, we will try to put all the things we have seen uh, these last three weeks already, three or four, uh, into practice to see how we can make a trading plan, how we make um, all the analysis that we have seen works all together, how to enter, how to exit, and how to manage a trade. And that's all. It will be a very big uh, topic. Yeah, if you remember the first presentation where we spoke about the four pillars, Next time, we are going to talk the third one, the technician in you. So how to find and enter the market using everything else. Uh, I also want to thank you for coming. I hope it was interesting for you. And I hope we'll see you again next week. Thanks. <laughs>